They've been asking me to do question time for a long time because, and I think that we can all agree this is true, Ramesh is too famous. He's too famous. <laughs> do you know that my mother asked me recently, when are we getting our travel program? <laughs> That's not how it works. We don't automatically have to get a travel program. Also, we can't have a travel program. I've seen those shows. Ramesh travels around with his mum, and his mum is super respectful to people. My mother is a loose cannon. You can't have me and my mum walking around a different country, and my mum just goes up to someone and goes, this is my son. I don't think he was molested. Anyway, they asked me for a long time and I kept saying no. Not because I have an object. Listen, we all have a problem with question time. But here's the thing, conceptually, at a conceptual level, I still believe in question time and its role in our democratic process. Here's the thing, we did one of these shows and there were four Americans in the second row and me and the audience got to explain to them what question time is. And when you have not heard of question time, it sounds like the greatest television program of all time. <laughs> Think about how you'd have to explain it. Oh, it's a room a bit like this, but there's sort of cameras everywhere just filming everything and then at the front there's a big desk and the host sits behind the desk. Then either side of the host are two politicians. They can't send proxies or representatives. These are actual politicians. Someone from the government and the opposition is there. And then either side of them are experts whose only job is to make those two look like fucking dickheads. Then for the audience what we do is we go into a town and we find the weirdest people. Just the absolute flotsam and jetsam of British society and we let them just yell at politicians and we give them microphones and we only give the microphones to the really weird. We vet them on the way in. Anyone got any spicy views? I think Lionel Richie did 9-11. Straight in, mate! <laughs> You're straight in with your Lionel Richie 9-11 theory. That's question one. I think ultimately it's accountability in action and if you're an entertainer you are an impediment to that accountability. Then here's what happened. I got real drunk. <laughs> Question time should not accept emails that arrive at 2.36 a.m. and are in all caps. Some of this shit is their fault. I got shit-faced, came home, turned on question time, and it was a parade of provocateurs, and I thought, oh, I must go on this program and represent my people. I'm the brown Braveheart, freedom. <laughs> then when I got there, the two other panelists were Dawn Butler and Gina Miller, a Labour MP and the anti-Brexit campaigner, both impeccably qualified women of colour. There was absolutely no need for Hummus McShits his pants. He adding nothing but this is a part of a wider pattern with me and alcohol since I turned 30 my relationship with alcohol changed when I turned 30 people tell you it's going to change but the change they say is absolute horseshit people say oh when you're 30 you can't handle alcohol anymore so you have bad hangovers people in your 30s that's not why you have bad hangovers you have bad hangovers because you drink 500 times more than you did in your 20s. You've got a decades more tolerance. When you're 21 years old, you have two sips of WKD and you're like, everybody kiss me now. Now, I'm 33 years old and I find myself at the pub at 10 a.m. going, give me four pints of gin. I know it's the morning, but I need to feel something. The problem with me is that when I turned 30, I became an emotional drunk. Now when I get drunk, I get emotional. I used to be fun, now I'm emotional. The last time I got drunk, I cried because I remembered a Neil Young song. That ruined a birthday party. At a family wedding last year, at one point I took my 11 and 13 year old cousins aside and said, no matter how old you get, you'll always be my babies. That is so weird. That is so weird that I did that. Also, those two can go fuck themselves. They're little shits and they can just fuck off. They hacked my Wikipedia page! <laughs> they went on my Wikipedia and they changed it so it said I weighed 10,000 billion tonnes and that every morning I wake up and stick a potato in my butt and they said that I'm best known as Madam Lily. That's what they call me. They call me Madam Lily. I am in my 11-year-old cousin's phone book as Madam Lily, colon, the traditional pervert. Where did he learn those words? Not even the worst prank that's been played on me in the last 12 months. The worst prank is performed by my friend, Rosie Jones, who's a comedian and a fucking douchebag. Rosie has cerebral palsy, and when the two of us are in the street together, she thinks it's funny to throw herself on the floor and shout, help, help, the man from the BBC pushed a disabled girl. <laughs> Everyone's out to get me.
Anyway, I want to tell you two things that happened the first time I did Question Time. The first thing was one of the other people there was a junior minister who I'd never heard of before. We've all heard of him now because his name is Dominic Raab. And many of you will surely remember him from last year when he was Brexit secretary for 27 minutes before heroically resigning in protest at his own negotiations. <laughs> You know when you're about to meet one of these people and you think, they can't all be cunts! And then you meet one and you're like, yeah. <laughs> As I walked into the Question Time green room, Dominic Raab was saying, nice to meet you, Nish, to a man who turned out to be Gina Miller's brother. <laughs> Basically, the first brown guy he saw. He just walked in and he was like, nice to meet you, Nish. I don't know how he, if he'd come around my house for Diwali, which he presumably refers to as Ramadan, he'd have lost his goddamn mind. He'd just been walking around being like, whoa, this is like when Eddie Murphy played Norbit. Oh my God, there's so many of Nish. <laughs> And the real thing that upset me is he didn't apologize. People come up to me all the time and they're like, hey, slumdog, whoa, sorry. But they at least have the decency to apologize. On two occasions, someone hasn't. One was Dominic Raab and the other was my fault because I was in a bar and a guy came up to me and went, hey, big fan. And I went, oh, thanks a lot. And he said, you're Riz Ahmed, right? Now, here's the thing. Riz Ahmed has been in Star Wars and he's won an Emmy and I love him. So when that guy thought I was Riz Ahmed, I was not racially offended. <laughs> when that guy thought I was Riz Ahmed, I responded by saying, <laughs> sort of. The other problem was the other panellist was Piers Morgan, and... Oh, I am sorry you had to hear his name, Hackney! Please let me know if I can provide any emotional support in your hour of need! I had to be in the room with a fucking dickhead! Listen, I don't know if any of you have met Piers Morgan. Equally, I don't know if any of you have been in a room with a man who you are on the public record as describing as what would happen if someone injected white privilege into a gammon steak. But... But let me tell you, it is awkward. And will, in my experience, result in your father coming with you to question time in case anything, and I'm quoting directly here, kicks off. I'm 33 years old, and my dad had to come with me to question time in case he had to fight Piers Morgan. <laughs> My mother was not allowed within a country mile of the place. She'd already made it quite clear if she's ever in a room with him. She will, and I'm loosely translating from the Malayalam here, shank the cunt. Whoa! Where'd you learn those words? Sounds like mum's been listening to some drill music. Now, something happened with that gammon comment. Last year, for six months, Gammon became the bane of my life because gammon became a slur used by left-wing people on the internet and directed at a certain type of angry, white, middle-aged male Brexit voter. The idea is that they've become so angry about Brexit that they've gone pink in the face and have become ham. So they get called gammons. Now, because this comment I made about Piers Morgan dates back to the early part of 2016, I am regularly credited as being the inventor of gammon. One website described me as the godfather of gammon, which, if I'm honest, is not a sobriquet I saw out when I embarked upon a career in show business. But the real problem is that it turns out if white dudes think a slur is aimed at them, you guys get real fucking uppity, which in my view is a bit rich. And so for about six months, once a week, I would get sent a link to a different conservative blog that was always some variation of this. Oh, gammon is the worst word in the English language. You have no idea the history and traditions of gammon. It all started in the 14th century when white people were forcibly transported as part of the transatlantic gammon trade. And they were taken to African countries like Wakanda, where they were forced to mine for vibranium for the king's magic Black Panther suits. Meanwhile, in the 1970s, white shop owners got called gammon shops and everyone would say, let's end the gammon shop, gammon and eggs, gammon and eggs, ba 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 <laughs> Meanwhile, in the late 80s, the term was reclaimed by white rappers as one of endearment, culminating in the seminal white hip-hop collective Gammons with Attitude GWA and their 1989 masterpiece, Straight Out of Shropshire. 